welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. All right, Reed. So for today's episode, we are going to talk about inflection points. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to share a couple of thoughts on why we're talking about this now. What is it that has caused us to want to reflect on the progression of the Air Force and our own careers? So I recently put on major, which actually was a surprise to me by the way. Okay. I knew I had been selected for major in the previous reserve officer selection board, major promotions, all those things. I knew that was coming, but my promotion date was going to be June of 22. And so I was looking ahead to that month, you know, middle of next year to finally become an FGO. But then I went to my annual tour with my unit here in Colorado just a couple weeks ago. And as I showed up, they said, Hey, we've submitted a request to have your promotion date moved up. I was like, oh, (laughs) that's cool. Thank you. Oh, and we're going to try and make that happen before you go to your training in California. And I was like, really? So I'm scheduled to do training in February. And I was like, really? So I could potentially be a major here in the next month or two. That's awesome. Really looking forward to that. It's going to be great. Obviously, you know, more money would be really nice. But also being able to make that transition from CGO to FGO is something that I've been looking forward to. Well, lo and behold, while I'm still there on annual tour, this was, I think, December 8th, I got an email saying that my request had been approved and my new date of rank was going to be December 15th. And I'm like, what? Wow, that's (laughs) that's really fast. (laughs) Here I'm looking at this memo that says, Congratulations, your request has been approved and you'll be able to promote to major on December 15th. And I'm like, I'm going to be a major in seven days. Holy shnikes. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of heads up. No. And um, so today is now December 18th that we're recording this. So I am now a major. Congrats, and Colin. Thank you. It still hasn't hit me yet because, you know, I've put it on the uniform, but I haven't put the uniform on. And I also haven't been at the unit wearing it. It hasn't fully hit me yet, but even so, the whole thing has me thinking about inflection points in the course of my career and how I've gotten to this point and where I'm going next. And so I invited you, Reed, to join me in this thought process. And, you know, we talk all the time about assessing self, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty common theme. And it's also something that's pretty common to do this time of year, right? We're getting to the end of the calendar year, setting New Year's resolutions, I think they're such a dirty word. Well, that's a whole nother subject, but <laughs> there's no time to set a goal like right now. I don't know. You've that's done my an episode thing. on that. I before. have. Yeah, I, I get a little passionate about that. But yeah, when you mentioned it, I thought it was exactly triggered by this, you know, all of a sudden Colin's an FGO thing. But I was also thinking, you know, it's kind of the end of the calendar year, pretty common time to think about this stuff. And as we discussed it, Colin, you know, prepping for this episode, this is one of those things that is a really healthy way to assess self mm-hmm. is to pull way back out of the minutia, out of the day to day and look at the entirety of your career or of, you know, the air force like you've discussed. So yeah, this is a good way to do this. If you don't know how to quote assess self, maybe you can pick up some ideas from our episode today. Yeah. So let's get into it. Reed, can you explain for us what is meant by an inflection point? Because there may be some people out there that are like, what? I, yeah. I don't even know what these guys are talking about. Yeah, certainly. This is where I get to uh, pull out the scientist. I'm very excited to welcome scientist <laughs> Reed to the show today. Actually, uh, there's a mathematical definition, and it's a point on a curve where there's a change in the curve. That is the technical definition of an inflection point. Yeah. However, that's not what we're talking about as much as I would love to talk about curves and lines and math and rates. And Sorry, Colin, I got to... 
put that away. Okay. Oof. Another episode. For another another time. episode. Yeah. What we are talking about is in like a business or organizational definition, which is an event that results in a significant change in the progress of a company, industry, sector, economy, geopolitical situation that is considered a turning point after which a dramatic change, either positive or negative results, can come from that inflection point. So we're welcoming now the economist, Reed, yeah, uh, yeah. To, the wannabe, to join us on the show. The wannabe self-taught economist and geopolitical strategist, yes. That, that's, I mean, you, you you pay attention to this kind of stuff, and, um, you both personally and professionally, right? Yeah. You look for these kinds of things. Absolutely, yeah. So what we would call these in the intelligence business are key indicators. Mm -hmm. So hypothetical scenario, good guy Landia might get invaded by bad guy Landia. Yeah. There will be things that could give you key indicators that that might happen. Right. And that's what we're talking about. These are those points where after which things are going to be different. And it can be either negative or positive, but it's a very healthy thing to kind of pull back and look at your career, your life, and think about what those inflection points are. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. And to further clarify what we're talking about here, the inflection point in the Air Force and in a person's career and an organization, these are not the highs and lows, the peaks and valleys, you know, of a person's growth or performance of an organization or a company or something like that. Rather, in peaks and valleys, highs and lows, those things are really easy to identify. Even as you're passing through them, you're like looking around, holy shnikes, everything is amazing right now. You know, I'm just firing all cylinders. My team is just crushing it right now. Man, things are awesome. Or vice versa. Whoa, I am in a hellhole right now and I need to get out of it. Like we know when we're at a peak or a valley, right? Yeah. Inflection points, on the other hand, are a little more difficult to identify and discern, especially as you're going through it, because you don't know what the end result is yet, right? Exactly. And sometimes, as you'll see in some of the ones that we discuss here, Colin, it could have gone either way. So the inflection point is just the key event that triggered the events to follow. And you may have even had a decision where you can influence that outcome a little bit. And at least with some of mine, as we go through them, you'll see that. So yeah, it's not the higher low. It's the path that got you to the higher low. And we've talked about some of the you know highs and lows of our careers as we've done this podcast, I've shared previously about how my experience being deployed was truly a peak for me. And also how later in my career, being in a position where I knew I could not continue on active duty, I could not be an ROTC instructor anymore. And seeing what that meant, that was a really difficult time. Yeah. And so like, you know, in our own experience, we've had these peaks and valleys that we've shared here on the podcast. Yeah. And Colin, like you, my deployment to Al-Udeed, huge peak. Is there an episode where I don't mention it? It's hard to know. <laughs> um, but a valley was the initial notification that I was going to be an OTS instructor and all my leadership around me saying, I sure hope your career can survive this. And again, you'll see that these were sometimes small things that occurred where we had opportunities to make decisions and then the result of those you know, had a pretty big impact as we progressed further. Peaks and valleys, those are things that people can readily recognize, harder to recognize the inflection points. And to help us with this, we think that it would be valuable to spend some time today looking at inflection points, not only in our own careers, but for the Air Force itself, you know, self-assessing the organization, you know, stepping way back and seeing what's been going on. And so that's the discussion we want to have today is to look at those inflection points, see what sort of lessons learned and takeaways we can pull out of these different examples and give the audience some opportunities, some actionable items that they can use for themselves as they round out this year, look ahead to what's coming in 22 and maybe create some inflection points for themselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Reed, why don't we get started by first looking at the Air Force? seeing what are some inflection points for the Air Force. And the way that I feel we should do this is following some sort of pattern where we look at what was the actual inflection point, what was the situation prior to that thing happening, 
what was the significant change? And then what was the ultimate result, peak or valley, or maybe even both in some circumstances, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's kick it off with, shall we say, the beginning, Colin, of sure. the Air Force. Maybe even before the beginning of the Air Force. Yeah, this is a really interesting one. And I really like what you did with this one. Let's put the inflection point as World War II and a combination of World War II and the Manhattan Project. So we're talking 1939, 1945. Yeah. Prior to World War II and the Manhattan Project, the idea of powered flight was just becoming a thing. I mean, the Wright brothers flew in the early 20th century and the army immediately recognized the value of powered flight, but not in the way that we as airmen do. It was right. all reconnaissance and support of ground forces. And that is what aircraft did. Yeah. They signaled, they supported the troops on the ground. Maybe they looked ahead to see what the adversary was doing far away someplace. But overwhelmingly, it was still very, very ground-centric. Yeah, and not meant to be directly involved in combat. Or having its own deliberate combat effects. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So in the interim between the Great Wars and during the early parse and into World War II and just immediately after, you know, names like Henry Arnold, Spatz, uh, Fairchild, Curtis LeMay, Billy Mitchell and others really pioneered the idea of what air power could do. But it wasn't really until World War II and the practice of strategic bombing did the Air Force really come into its own and demonstrate the power and effectiveness of air for its own combat effects. Combine that with the advent and use of nuclear weapons, and you have truly changed the face of warfare. That was the inflection point, right? War has yeah. never been the same. And applying an understanding and valuing air power and nuclear power resulted in the creation of the United States Air Force and ultimately in the Cold War. And I mean, it shaped our geopolitical future from that moment on. So thinking about that inflection point and how it had such a massive impact on our service, without those events, it's easy to see how maybe our service wouldn't even exist in its current form. Exactly. Yeah. When the Air Force is directly responsible for two parts of the nuclear triad in the form of strategic bombing and the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM, mission. You can see how World War II and the Manhattan Project and the eventual Cold War and all those things brought about the Air Force that we have today. Now, the Air Force is not exactly the same as it was, and we'll get into more detail on like how more inflection points have continued to morph and change the Air Force, but those two capabilities are central and foundational to what we do as airmen and what we do as an Air Force. Absolutely. Colin, why don't you introduce the next one? I think you just recently finished a book about this. Oh, goodness, yeah. So John Boyd is just a fascinating character to study. You know, he's pretty well known, but not as well known as he should be, I think, in terms of the influence that he has had on the direction of the Air Force and kind of like what we were saying about World War II and the Manhattan Project, shaping the Air Force into what it is now. So really between 1960 and 1975, that's when he was most prolific and active in the generation of his military theories. And so that is the inflection point is 1960, 1975. But prior to that time, you know, what was the situation? It was an Air Force that was in the middle of a Cold War, right? Just like we were saying. But Putting the nuclear capability and the strategic bombing to the side, what was the fighter aircraft side of things doing? The invention of jet-propelled aircraft and moving toward you know, the breaking of the sound barrier with Chuck Yeager and the test pilots at Edwards into supersonic aircraft, that was where the Air Force thought the future was. Speed. Speed, yeah. Speed is life, right? You've heard that before? And that's not wrong, but the problem was is that these aircraft were so fast that you couldn't control them. There was no maneuverability. All you could do was go really fast in a straight line. And in some instances, these aircraft were even designed without, without a gun on board. Like you couldn't fire anything except for missiles. And, you know, there were pros and cons to those kinds of things. But ultimately, it led to John Boyd, who was an amazing pilot, looking at what was going on with the design of these aircraft and 
what he was capable of in dogfighting and, you know, his aerial combat study. And this all eventually led to the energy maneuverability theory and also the creation of his OODA loop. And that also led to other things like patterns of conflict, creation, and destruction, all these other things that John Boyd is really well known for. But the EM theory specifically was an inflection point to the Air Force because it eventually led to the design of the F-15, the F-16, the F-A-18 for the Navy, and the ability for the Air Force to create a capability and doctrine around air supremacy. And without that capability and doctrine of air supremacy, so much of what we've done over the last you know, 30, 40 years would just not be possible. If we didn't control the skies in any conflict that we were a part of, then what we do on land or on sea or in other areas just would not be possible, right? Yeah. And I think that's a really good way to transition to the next inflection point that we wanted to discuss because it was our capability in the air, one could argue, that largely led to this next period, yeah. this next inflection point. So uh, this next inflection point is the period between Desert Storm and essentially the end of the global war on terror. So 1990 through about 2020, and that includes 9-11. So prior to Desert Storm, the geopolitical situation was largely based on the Cold War, so bipolar power centers, mm -hmm. and mutually assured destruction via nuclear weapons. John Boyd, his energy maneuvering theory, the F-15, the F-16, and our general technological capabilities had created a fighting force unparalleled in history. Right. And that was demonstrated viscerally in Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think of Iraq now, we don't necessarily think of a capable, competent, and a well-equipped military force. Right. We remember is ISIS rolling in and the Iraqi army kind of falling apart over a two-week period. That was not the case in the 1990s. Saddam Hussein had assembled what at the time was the fourth largest military force on the planet. Mm -hmm. They had fighter aircraft. They had surface. They had an integrated air defense system with surface-to-air missiles. They had ballistic missiles. They had, you know, quite the armored capability. They were the fourth largest fighting force and a worthy adversary. They were yeah. well equipped, well trained, and Desert Storm demonstrated just how far beyond anyone else on the planet the United States was. Yeah. We achieved air supremacy relatively quickly. We dominated the ground forces. We rolled into and just took over that country exceptionally quickly with very few casualties. It was like nothing anyone had ever seen before. And that's directly a result of the previous inflection point that we talked about. And yeah, so you could even say that Desert Storm is a peak that resulted from the inflection point of John Boyd's military theories and the EM theory. Yeah, yeah, I think that's totally fair. So the significant change that resulted from that is that nearly all our nation state adversaries recognized they could not go toe to toe with the United States. Mm -hmm. And other non-government organizations also recognized that if they were to draw a line in the sand, say, this is our side, this is your side, come at me, bro, they were going to lose. Right. Which led to a shift in emphasis in how adversaries were going to target the United States to include asymmetric warfare, terrorism. And as a result, we had to change what we did. We moved, as a result of 9-11, to special warfare, counterterrorism, asymmetric warfare, counterterrorism operations, which was, again, a massive shift in how we employed force. And in the intervening period, our near peer nation states, they decided to continue to build their capability. Yeah. And so now we have this situation where as a result of us thrashing the fourth largest military, everyone had to like take a step back and go, hmm, how are we going to beat the United States? And then they begin to prepare. And for that entire period, they begin to prepare while we fought the global war on terror, which we should have done. And now we are in a near peer competition where we have to accelerate change or lose. And so it may be a little bit of a valley there, but a very interesting 
situation that resulted in, as a result of our complete dominance, especially in the technological warfare sphere. Yeah. There's so much more that could be said about these things. It is worth your time as an Air Force officer or as a potential Air Force officer to go and study World War II, Manhattan Project, John Boyd and his military theories, EM theory, the patterns of conflict, the way that Desert Storm played out, the same thing for the global war on terror, how we got involved, how we got mired in the business of counterterrorism. We learned a lot of really important things from that. So I don't want it to seem as though we shouldn't have participated in the global war on terror. But these are the things that have gotten us to the point where we are now. And it behooves you as an officer, someone who wants to become one, to understand these things. Yeah. And Colin, I think, you know, there's even some that are, you know, happening now or maybe lesser known that we can maybe review kind of quickly. You know, let's look at how promotions occurred back in the day, you know, Prior to the current system, basically, you had to have some senior officer die, (laughs) essentially, right? They'd stay in forever in order for promotion. And so things kind of stagnated. Well, you had DOPMA, which changed and created this up or out promotion based on time and service, time and grade. And that has created some challenges. Yeah, And so that's undergoing review. People are talking about that, right? Below the zone promotions for Air Force officers just got revoked. And so we're going to this promotion window thing. We've got Don't Ask, Don't Tell and Department of the Air Force Diversity, Equality and Inclusion, where previous policies of administrations banned certain members from serving in the military. And I mean, we could go on with that, but it's led to changes that are healthy and good for our service. We have an African-American chief of staff. First African-American service chief for any service, right? And I mean, our sisters in arms are able to wear their hair down because we as a service are taking a more critical look at diversity, inclusion, and the policies that we have put on ourselves and are also required of us by Congress. So there's a lot that is changing in that regard. What are some other things, Colin, that are kind of happening now or have been going on forever? Yeah, I mean, look at what's going on with the Space Force, the emphasis on that service being able to more or less like forge its own destiny, the recognition of space as its own legitimate domain for warfighting, similar with cyber. Now, there's not a cyber force yet, but there is a cyber comm, a full-fledged combatant command dedicated to fighting our wars in the cyber domain. Now. It still remains to be seen whether that's going to lead to an actual peak or potentially a valley, but we definitely know that those are inflection points, the creation of Cybercom and the Space Force. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really good point to recognize that we're in one. We just don't know how it's going to shake out yet. Yeah. Little things like we hear about identity theft, we hear about you know, viruses and Trojans and and all these other things that happen in the cyber realm, we're still trying to define what even social norms should be with respect to a phone. Like, are you allowed to bring it out during a polite conversation or not? You know, like we're still in the middle of this inflection point. It's going to be interesting for the next, you know, I'd say generation or so for sure. Yeah. And similar to the emphasis on cyber, Take a look at what's going on with the Air Forces and the DOD's information technology and software domain as a whole. You know, this isn't actually really an inflection point because things are just terrible and have been for, (laughs) for a long time. But one thing that really sticks out in my mind is that back in September, the Department of the Air Force's first chief software officer ever resigned because of all of the barriers and resistance that he was up against in trying to change the way that the Air Force handles its information and employs software. Yeah. Um, I did not know this, but apparently the Department of Defense is the largest software organization on the planet. We hire more software engineers than any organization on the planet, yet we can barely function to do simple, basic things in our IT sphere. So nothing's really changed. It's still broken. It has been. And, you know, maybe this could be the inflection point that kicks off a change. Just recently, we had a senior 
general officer from the Pentagon come and talk to us about this. It took this person 15 minutes from the time they put a CAC in their CAC reader to open an email. And they're a general officer, so it's not just us down here in the weeds. Yeah, It's everybody. So, you know, hopefully this could be an inflection point. But the point is, we're in some of these inflection points, and we're not sure how they're going to shake out yet. But to recognize that they're occurring provides us an opportunity to maybe affect that change. And I think that's one of the important things that can come from this type of analysis, where you think about what's going on, think about the history that led to that point, note, you know, whether a change is occurring or not, and then looking at the result. I think that's a really healthy way to think about what's going on. Yeah. All right, Reed. So we've covered a lot of ground. We see from all of these different examples that the Air Force, the Department of Defense, the United States in general, they are all capable of some really incredible things, as well as getting in their own way, getting stuck in the mire, being unable to you know, pull up fast enough before things really start to crash and burn. And something that is common across all of these is to recognize that in order for the inflection point to be what it was, that there was a person or a group of people who did something, right? And as a result of that something, things changed. Now, this is important to understand because it shows that the Air Force, the DOD, the United States can change. Yes, they are all very big, unwieldy organizations that are fraught with bureaucracy and subject to things like organizational inertia, right? You know, these are things that are true to any large organization, but we recognize that they are also complex adaptive systems. And I've talked about that recently. If you tuned into the episode about books and what we've been reading previously, complex adaptive systems doesn't mean that they can't change. It means that they can. It's just very complex the way that the change happens. So what I want to emphasize here is that because they are complex, because they are adaptive, these systems have been, are, and will continue to be influenced and change in ways that are both good and bad. And so we need to recognize that we own this, especially we as officers, we own the Air Force. We own those peaks and valleys and the creation of those inflection points. Yeah, no, totally. And I think now is a good time, Colin, for us, you and me, to go through this exercise and look at our careers and look for some of those inflection points, talk about you know, what led to them, the changes, and the kind of the result so that we can really nail down for our audience how you and I have done this and analyze our inflection points and maybe give them some examples that they can go from. Do you want to kick it off or do you want me to? Yeah, I can take it. And just like we've done with the examples of the Air Force, we'll look at what was the situation prior to, what was the change, what resulted, what came as a result of the inflection point. But also, you know, just like we didn't completely exhaust every possible inflection point for the Air Force, we're not going to do it for our careers, but hopefully providing some of these examples will give you, the audience, an opportunity to reflect on your own career, your own life up to this point, your own experiences, and identify some of these different inflection points. So the first one for me came in 2008. I was at field training, and the situation prior to going to field training is that uh, I was full into Air Force ROTC. I was firing all cylinders. I was really enjoying it, having a great time. I was given recognition as the freshman of the year, AS100 of the year, and asked to be the wing adjutant, which is like you know, the GMC lackey, <laughs> the underclass lackey to uh, the upper class or the professional officer course or POC. It was a big responsibility and I was honored to, to have it and continued to perform really well through my second year got the opportunity to go to field training. And in my initial conversation with my FTO, my flight training officer, he asked me what I wanted to do in the Air Force. And I said, I didn't know yet. I was honest with him. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had various ideas, but I hadn't decided on one. And he told me in my exit interview that that moment, that very first moment, he flagged me as a potential SIE. Reed, can you explain what an SIE is? Yeah, self-identified elimination. This is somebody who quits for no external reason other than they just choose to not pursue a commission. Yeah, so unbeknownst to me, let the rest of the staff know to keep an eye on this cadet Slade because he's probably going to drop out. 
And he told me in my exit feedback that because of that, he would not let me finish any higher than bottom third, even though I knew everything. Like I did really well, at least I thought. And because of that situation, the valley that resulted from that significant change is I stopped taking ROTC seriously. I just went along to get along. And, you know, I own that. I probably shouldn't have done that, that I should have shown some a little more maturity. But ultimately, that meant that I was not prepared for active duty as well as I could have been. So that's my first inflection point. Not all of these are downers. So let's pick things up a little bit. We've shared in the past, even in this episode earlier, that our deployments were really important to us. And yes, my deployment to Al Yadid was a peak, but I also want to point it out as an inflection point as well, because it pulled me out of kind of a rut with how things were going back at home station, almost as a result of my lack of preparation for being on active duty, right? I got deployed and there I had firsthand experience finally of how I fit and what my responsibility was as an officer in the projection of air power and how CE, the civil engineering career field, participated in all of that. It was so important to me, so foundational and formative and life-changing that it led me to volunteer for another deployment that I did not have to go on. But I knew what was coming and what the opportunity was there before me. And so I volunteered for another deployment in 2015 to go to Jordan. And I had an absolute blast. It was phenomenal. So there's a peak for you as a result of an inflection point. Another inflection point was my time as an ROTC instructor. You know, recognizing that I did not do as well as I could have as a cadet. Maybe this was my opportunity to go <laughs> make up for that you know, poor performance there. And my time as an ROTC instructor was incredible. Prior to that, I was working as an academic advisor. So I was already trying to have a career in academia. But instead of ending up as an academic, I found myself back in the Air Force on active duty again, responsible for the growth and development of future officers. And so the significant change there is the opportunity to deep dive into all things being an Air Force officer and leadership and professional development. And Reed, what's the result of that? Um, this podcast, Colin, is the right. result of that. <laughs> the conversations that we have been having and putting out there for public consumption over the last two and a half years would not have been possible if I did not go into ROTC as an instructor and also you read as an OTS instructor, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so then you can see there how these inflection points not only change our own personal careers, but can also be an influence on other people around us. And then the last one that I want to share, last inflection point here is my leaving active duty for the second time, leaving ROTC and then becoming an actual traditional reservist, which I had never done before, and the opportunity to cross train into a different career field. Obviously, prior to that, I was a CE officer where you know I found a love for civil engineering through my deployments, but I knew that I was not as good of an officer and as good as a civil engineer as I wanted to be, as I could be. And so I took this opportunity to cross train so that I could learn some new skills, kind of reinvent myself as an officer and see a different side of the Air Force. Having been in the support side, coming into operations and seeing how things work there. And oh, by the way, not just the Air Force, but since I'm cross training it to be a space operations officer, seeing the Space Force and potentially being able to participate in the development of that service as it gets off the ground. And so the result is that I feel like I have found a new home, a new tribe, a calling even, and I haven't even been through the training pipeline yet. But my experiences so far up to this point have been such that I would definitely call them a peak. And I'm just really excited to see what may come next. That's awesome. I think those are really good. And I appreciate you giving those to us both the good and the bad, right? I think it's healthy to point out you have some personal responsibility towards some of these, but also not all of them are great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some of these were valleys. And that's actually kind of where I'm going to start. I'm going to start off with a not that great 
So my first inflection point is being forcibly cross-trained in 2011. So I originally commissioned as a chemist and I was at my first duty station. I was doing well. Um, I was awarded the wing CGO of a quarter as a second lieutenant, which is not very common. I was getting a lot of feedback that I was performing well. My boss, my boss's boss, everyone seemed to be happy with what I was doing. I even sat down with the assignments team from my career field and they said, hey, by the way, you're the only CGO in your career field. You have a master's in your field in the scientific realm. Most people had a master's in something else, which is fine. So I was feeling pretty good. You know, like everything's going well. I love the job. I love the location. The significant change was that I got an email from AFPC that stated they had hired too many chemists over the intervening three or four years or so, and that they had an overage and that I needed to either get a new job, cross train into a different career field, or I needed to separate. <laughs> I'd been in the Air Force all of about a year at this point. And the result of that is that ever since I have not felt safe in the Air Force and safe in the, like, my job is not secure way. Yeah. I've never felt like physically threatened or, you know, by any person or anything like that. What I'm talking about is that our positions as active duty members wearing the uniform and working on behalf of your nation is precarious. Every single one of us is subject to decisions that are well beyond our control that can have an impact resulting in you being asked to leave the service. And what that's done is it's pushed me. So this is kind of a peak thing, this side of it. Yeah, it's a peak valley. It's, it's a peak valley. Valley, it's not good that I don't feel safe and my secure that I'm going to stay employed. That's not good. The peak ish thing is that it's really driven me to be successful as much as I can, as much as I can control and stay as safe as I can, right? It's hard to fire the guy or gal who's doing well, who is maybe getting awards, who is getting promoted, you know, those kinds of things. And also a valley, it's probably unhealthy, the amount of time and energy I spend to try and be successful. So it's definitely a mixed bag, but yeah, that was kind of my first one. Not exactly a good time for sure. Getting a, hey, don't care how successful you've been, you're about to get fired, you know, is not a good feeling. The next one, this one is definitely Pecan Valley. This is a mix of both. So this was the order I got from my senior leadership to help them with the construction of a, what's called the SIDO team. So the SIDO is the senior intel duty officer. It's also a team, the senior intel duty officer team. And at an air operations center, they provide current intel to the chief of combat ops who is making decisions for the execution of air power in that theater. And I had just come from Al-Udeed where I had done this for real in actual combat. You know, we were generating sorties, we were blowing stuff up, we were beating bad guys. And I got back to PACAF and they said, hey, we're thinking about standing up a SIDO team. Even though we're in peacetime, Generally, all the functions of the Air Operations Center don't need to happen, right? Because you're not fighting a war. But they wanted to stand up this intel team. And they said, you've actually done this. No one else here has done this for real. Uh, so we would like your advice, First Lieutenant Gan. And I gave it. The change is that when I was deployed, I had earned my stripes, if you will. I was trusted. I was consulted and listened to. But when I got back, I was not a known quantity. A lot of my leadership had changed over and they ignored my recommendations. And they're like, mm. my recommendation is we don't need a SIDO team because we're not fighting a war. And they said, okay, cool. Thanks, Lieutenant. We're going to do a SIDO team. It's going to be a 24-hour team. And I'm, okay. So the result was me definitely losing some faith in my leadership and feeling really dejected that, you know, I have done this for real. I actually know what I'm talking about. And really feeling not counted on, you know, like I thought I was good at this. But the peak that resulted is I decided to work hard anyway. Okay, I think this is a dumb decision, but I'm going to work hard anyway, and I'm going to give this everything I've got. And what resulted is I was promoted to the leader of that team more quickly than many of my peers. And that put me in front of senior leadership 
you know, two and three star generals on a regular basis. And I'm still benefiting from, as we've talked, Colin, the pitch came my way and I was able yeah. to hit a couple balls and, and get on base a few times. So that's one of those definitely mixed bag, right? Like I got pretty jaded for a young captain. I promoted to captain during that time. But um, yeah, a little peak and valley there with that one. Last one, you know, as we kind of wind down our personal stories, I was deployed in 2019 to the United Kingdom. The situation prior to that is that an organization that sponsored was looking for people to deploy had been tasked to stand up a specific type of Air Force unit at a specific location in the United Kingdom. And I wholeheartedly believed in that function, the type of mission that we were being asked to stand up. And I was really excited to deliver that capability to the Air Force. The change was when I got there and actually saw what was going on on the ground, we did not need to be there in that capacity. The Air Force needed to be there, but we couldn't be doing the function that we were sent there to do. And so here I am with multiple three-star generals telling me, make this happen. And my response is, no, <laughs> this is wrong. And keep in mind, they're paying me an unholy amount of money to live an hour north of London mm -hmm. to make this happen. But it wasn't right. And the result, definitely a peak, is I had another senior leader come to visit. This was an, an 06, a wing commander. And their purpose and intent was to like, let's finally seal the deal on this. Let's make this happen. Let's either kill it or let's make it real. And I was able to successfully tell them that the way that this thing is being done right now is wrong. Here is the right way to do it. And I do firmly believe that this is how we should do it. And that's a really scary thing, Colin, to tell someone all the money and time you spent was dumb <laughs> and <laughs> this is how it needs to be done correctly, but it worked. They listened. The U.S. Air Force has established a permanent unit at this organization doing the function that I envisioned, and I didn't get fired. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't throw me out on my ear. And as a result of that, the peak is that I have now been sought for a few times to tackle hard problems. And I have learned how to tell people that this is dumb and do it in a professional way and do it so that they aren't personally offended and that the broader service benefits. And even though that's not always fun, it's actually scary every single time. I do feel that that inflection point of being put in that situation has given me a tool set that I frankly didn't want to learn Right. Yeah, it's just not something that I sought to learn, but I'm grateful that I have now. And, you know, really interesting, you know, some of these things were, you know, geopolitical happened to us. And then others are things that we kind of sought out. This one I did not want. When I showed up and I saw the restrictions, the constraints that we were operating under, I realized that we just simply couldn't do the job that we were asked to do. And I was like, dang, <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell really important people that this is not good. And that was a real challenge. So what's the takeaway, Reed? What is the lesson learned? What is the value? Now that we've gone through all of these different inflection points from our own careers, we've also looked at the Air Force. So what? Why does this exercise matter? Why was it useful for us? And why would it be useful to our audience? Yeah, I think the big take home for me is helping me to define when I can be an agent and act and when I'm just an object being acted on, mm -hmm. no matter what, I still get a choice. I still get to choose what I do. Whether I'm the object and I have no power to influence or change the situation, I can still change my attitude. I can still change what I do as a result. And I can make a difference, whether it's to my personal life or my family or my friends around me, or a bigger change where I make the Air Force different because of what I choose. I think that's the biggest thing that I took out of this is I always have a choice. Yeah, you do. And there's also a benefit in being situationally aware. You know, we talk about SA, right? That you want to be aware of your surroundings and what's going on around you. And I don't know how you feel about this read, but my personal assessment of the Air Force, the Space Force Department of the Air Force as a whole, maybe the DOD at large, we are passing through a very significant inflection point right now. 
We don't know where it's going to go. We don't know whether we're going to end up in a peak or a valley. But the combination of everything that we described earlier of the result of John Boyd's theories, the appropriate use of air power, nuclear power, the conclusion of the global war on terror, the rise of near peer competition, all of these things, plus the other stuff that we talked about, the creation of the Space Force and Cybercom, the emphasis on diversity, equity, inclusion, the Air Force's software and information technology situation, all of these things to me combined up to this point feel like a pretty significant inflection point. Yeah. What is your assessment, Reed? Well, I think that's why the chief of staff wrote Accelerate, Change, or Lose, because that's exactly where we are. And I totally agree. And I think this exercise is healthy because it's helped to show that to us. Yeah. Yeah. I can read a paper all day long from the chief of staff, but if I don't go through something like this and then really have it like witnessed to me that we're in that inflection point, it doesn't mean as much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, his paper means more after I've thought about this process. Yeah. And because the Department of the Air Force is in this inflection point, I feel like my own inflection point is magnified even more. Like I have even greater responsibility for participating in the Air Force's inflection point, as well as positioning myself in my own career where I can affect change, where I can help the inflection point that the Air Force is going through to result in a peak instead of a valley. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. We encourage you at this massive inflection point, either in the calendar year, if that's where you want to start, you know, with you and assessing self and thinking about your previous year, or if you want to, you know, come to 85,000 feet and look at the Air Force and its journey and its place in the world as a whole. You know, think about where we are. Think about the situation that led to where we are. Think about what changes occurred that really changed the curve. And then think about the result. And I think it can be a really valuable experience. It certainly was for me. I appreciate you all joining us today. Colin, is there anything you want to add before you wrap up? Nope, that'll do it. Thanks for being here with me, Reed. Thanks for participating in the exercise. And we want to hear from the audience too, right? So, you know, reach out to us, send us your inflection points. We'd love to have uh, your perspective on the Air Force for your own individual careers. Follow that same pattern. You know, what is the inflection point? What was the situation prior to? What was the significant change? And then what was the result? Peak or Valley? We want to hear them both. Send those to us at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com or engage with us on our social media platforms. We would love to hear those from you. Awesome. Thanks everybody for joining us. That'll wrap it up for this week's episode of Commission Ed.